Okay, here's the cast of main characters for the show today. We've already heard a lot about Luther, of course, and we'll finish his career and also hear about Erasmus, who was just about as critical of the church as Luther, but refused to break with it. We'll also hear about some more of the important German artists of the Reformation era, including Cronach, Altdorfer, and Matthias Grunewald, whose Eisenheim altarpiece is one of the most impressive such things ever painted. We'll also hear some more music by, in fact, Martin Luther himself, Michael Pretorius, and others. Then we'll be back in England, which we left at the death of Henry V. Henry VI, Edward IV, and Richard III are going to be involved in the War of the Roses, and that will come to an end with the victory of Henry VII, who established the Tudor dynasty on the throne after his victory over Richard at Bosworth Field. And after the break, we'll hear about his son, Henry VIII, certainly one of the most interesting of all English kings. We'll see Hampton Court and Hever Castle, see pictures of everybody who was anybody painted by Hans Holbein, and even hear some music Henry VIII himself wrote. So this is the Protestant monument at Worms, which we saw last time. When Luther met the Emperor, Charles V, at the Diet of Worms in 1521, he knew he had little chance of persuading him to accept his point of view, and many of his friends feared that he would be so far from persuading Charles he was right that he would in fact be arrested for being thought so damnably wrong. But while Charles V was not persuaded, and told Luther he would enforce the papal excommunication of him if he did not recant within three weeks. He did not arrest him. He was allowed to leave. On his way back to Wittenberg, Luther did, however, disappear, and many of those who had feared for his safety, including Albrecht Dürer, thought he had been kidnapped by agents of the Pope, while in fact, however, Frederick the Wise, who had refused to agree with the Emperor's condemnation of him at Worms, had taken matters and Luther into his own hands. This is another drawing by Albrecht Dürer of an unknown German knight, but it could be Ulrich von Hutten or Franz von Sickingen, who were among the foremost supporters of the Lutheran movement, among the nobility in which class Luther had many friends. His tract called The Address to the German Nobility, published shortly before the meeting at Worms, had called for, among other things, the church to restrict itself to purely spiritual affairs and to stay out of German politics. In effect, Luther had also called for the establishment of a German national church and for an end to the endless taxation of Germany for the benefit of a foreign administration in Rome, which wasted the money in any case. This was much applauded by many in the German ruling class and by many below it as well. Luther was taken to Frederick the Wise's fortress called the Wartburg up above Eisenach. In the class on the Middle Ages, we saw this in connection with the famous Sanger Krieg in the days of Frederick II and Walter von der Vogelweide. While Luther was here from May 1521 to February 1522, he occupied himself with translating the Bible into German and in writing hymns. How much of the music for the hymns he wrote is still unclear, but many of them were probably first set to music by his friend Johann Walter, who was Frederick the Wise's Kapellmeister. It's thought likely, however, that Luther wrote both the words and the music to the most famous of his hymns, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, ein guter Wehren Waffen. A mighty fortress is our God. We'll hear that hymn now while we see a little bit more of the Wartburg, and you may be reminded by this music also of Bach's cantata of the same name, because Bach used the same melody. Here's the Wartburg from ground level now. <laughs> 
it looked in the winter of 1521-22 when Luther was here. This is the entrance to the room where Luther stayed. And the interior now with a portrait of him on the wall by his friend Lucas Crown. There had been many translations of at least parts of the Bible into German before Luther's version, but they were all based on the Latin Vulgate, whereas Luther used Erasmus's 1516 edition of the New Testament in Greek. He published this German New Testament in 1522 after his return to Wittenberg, but the Old Testament wasn't finished for another 12 years, and then with the help of Melanchthon and Jewish scholars who assisted with the Hebrew. The Gotha Public Library has his first draft of the New Testament, and I would not have wanted to be the printer who had to deal with this. This is a man who needed a word processor. Luther's Bible translation did have something of the effect in Germany that the King James Version was to have in England. Over a hundred thousand copies were printed in his lifetime, and it had a major effect on the demise of Latin and the movement to use German for literary and scholarly purposes, and it is still widely considered the greatest work of German prose ever written. There's the picture by Cronach of Luther on the wall of his room at the Wartburg again. While he was in hiding, he also grew a beard to disguise his appearance and went by the name of Jorg the Merchant. Meanwhile, the Reformation in Wittenberg and elsewhere was going on apace without him. In fact, the archdeacon of the castle church in Wittenberg, Andreas Karlstadt, had gotten married and was celebrating the Mass in street clothes, in German, in addition to giving communion in both kinds without prior confession. He had also ordered all religious images, including the crucifix, removed from the church and banned all music from the service. This is another portrait, a woodcut of Luther by Cronach. Luther was a great lover of music, and whether or not the banishment of music from the service by Karlstadt was the last straw, Luther resolved to brave the threat of excommunication, come out of hiding and go back to Wittenberg. On his return, he preached moderation, arguing that things like religious images and music were not in themselves wrong, and he condemned the violence which some of the radicals had used against those reluctant to tow the new Protestant line. Karlstadt was fired and left Wittenberg in a huff, calling Luther the new Pope of Wittenberg, and in fact Luther was soon to be generally regarded by many radicals he'd originally inspired as an old fuddy-duddy who lacked the will to carry through his ideas to their conclusions. Before the so-called Peasants' War began, although Luther himself was by no means a social revolutionary, it was virtually impossible to criticize the church in the way that he did without threatening the government and social organization with which the church was so closely tied up. In any case, Thomas Munzer and his allies, who preached a kind of communistic lifestyle and who argued for the extermination by the sword of all those less radical than themselves, gathered an army of mostly poor farmers and lower class laborers who were led militarily by soldiers like Florian Geyer and Getz von Berlickingen. And this is Berg Hornberg, Getz's castle, which is now a hotel. Munzer claimed that even the Bible must take second place as an authority to direct revelation from God of the sort he claimed to have had. Bible babble bubble, he proclaimed, the truth has been revealed to me. This is another view of the Hornberg. Getz especially has been treated as a hero of the Reformation, most notably in Goethe's play about him, 
But many historians regard him and the other leaders of the rebellion as having been, in fact, more like robber barons than champions of the poor. Luther allowed that the peasants had just grievances, but he was appalled by the murdering and looting that accompanied their arguments and blasted them as only Luther could blast someone in his 1525 pamphlet against the robbing, murdering hordes of peasants. In 1525, Frederick the Wise, who had done his best to keep the peace and had truly been worthy of his name, died and was succeeded by his militant brother, known as John the Steadfast. This is Lucas Cronach's portrait of John now, and having put together an army of his own, he clobbered Munzer and the peasant forces at Frankenhausen and beheaded Munzer himself. Geyer disappeared, Getz made his peace with the emperor, and things calmed down, although it was not until the Peace of Augsburg in 1555 that Charles and his Protestant princes made something like a lasting peace based on the famous principle, cuius regio, eus religio, or whose land, his religion. In other words, in essence, each elector could choose between Lutheranism and Catholicism, and his subjects who didn't like the choice just had to pack their bags. This was obviously a flawed idea, but it was about the best solution that could be arranged at the time, and it helped keep order in Germany until the Thirty Years' War, 50 years later. In the middle of the Peasants' War, a wagon load of displaced nuns arrived in Wittenberg, and Luther, feeling to some extent responsible for their situation, resolved to find husbands for them. And he succeeded with eight of the nine. Unable, however, to find a mate for Catherine von Bora here, the last of them, who was regarded as barely still marriageable at 26, he married her himself, to some extent to please his father, to whom he'd become reconciled and who wanted grandchildren. They did have six children of their own and adopted eleven more, and Duke John gave them the whole old abandoned Augustinian monastery to live in, and it still stands in Wittenberg. Although he continued to write and remained the spiritual inspiration for most German Protestants from 1525 on, he was less and less at the forefront and 17 children will take up a lot of the father's time. Some of his biographers find the later Luther to be a bit embarrassing now and then in his vituperation and arrogance, but anyone who writes 56 volumes of published work can be forgiven for writing some embarrassing stuff at least. This is Durer's engraved portrait of Philip Melanchthon, who from 1525 on became more and more the point man for the Lutheran movement in Germany. It was Melanchthon, rather than Luther, who presented the Lutheran case at the Diet of Spire in 1529, where the term Protestant is said to have been first used to designate those who wouldn't go along with an imperial decree requiring toleration of Catholicism in Lutheran states, but not requiring the toleration of Lutheranism in Catholic states. And it was also Melanchthon who formulated the Augsburg Confession of 1530, which became the constitution of the Lutheran faith. This is a portrait of Luther by Cronach done in 1533. As I mentioned earlier, Cronach was one of Luther's best friends. He made woodcuts to illustrate editions of his German Bible and also loaned him a lot of money. In the winter of 1546, Luther went to Eisleben, where he'd been born, to mediate a quarrel between two noblemen. He had not been well for some time, and he died there on February 17th. His body was returned to Wittenberg, where it was buried under the pulpit of the castle church, where Melanchthon and Frederick the Wise are also buried. Five.
This is a portrait sketch of Lucas Cronach by Albrecht Durer. Cronach arrived in Wittenberg to work for Frederick the Wise in 1505, and over the next 40 years or so of his long life, he turned out hundreds of paintings and hundreds more prints. In one year, he painted 60 portraits of Frederick alone. He was, in fact, known as Pictor Kellerimus, the fastest painter, and had a workshop that usually included at least 10 assistants to help him keep turnaround time to a minimum on the commissions that flooded his studio from Protestants and Catholics alike. Cronach's portrait of Frederick the Wise's cousin, Henry the Pious here, is considered the first independent life-size portrait of a subject. Durer's life-size portraits of the Pomgartner brothers, which we saw last time on the wings of their altarpiece or earlier, but they are not independent portraits in the same sense. They are represented in a religious context as donors. Cronach is most well known, however, for the hundreds of Venuses, Dianas, Helens of Troy, and so on like this one, which were cranked out by his factory in such a uniform style that it's almost impossible to tell today which ones he might actually have painted. This is the Marienkirche in Wittenberg, where Luther was married, where his children were baptized, and where his wife was buried, and in 1547, the year Luther died, Cronach painted the so-called Reformation altar for it, which you see in the distance. Luther is here portrayed as one of the apostles receiving the communion cup of wine from someone who looks like Henry the Pious. In the left wing, baptism is represented with Melanchthon apparently officiating. In the right hand scene, confession is said to be the subject, but the prominence given it here is a little surprising since at least compulsory confession is opposed in the Augsburg Confession. Before we leave Luther, I might just mention that I think if he were still around, he'd probably be pretty pleased by the post-Vatican II Catholic Church. The selling of indulgence is the thing that really got to him, was actually abolished all the way back in the 16th century by the Council of Trent. The service in the vernacular language, another thing on his agenda, has now been adopted, and communion can even be taken in both kinds on certain occasions within the Roman Catholic system. Also, at the 1999 ecumenical meeting between Catholic and Lutheran representatives at, significantly, Augsburg, all parties were well behaved, apologized for having been badly behaved for 500 years, and agreed that as Christians they do have some important things in common. <laughs> Lucas Cronach himself lived to be nearly 80, and this is possibly a self-portrait by him at 78, though many believe the picture was actually painted by his son. In 1520, when Durer was touring the Low Countries, he drew this sketch of Desiderius Erasmus, who, like Luther, was very critical of the papacy and the church administration, but who, however, refused to break with it. He was, to an extent, educated by the Brethren of the Common Life, about whom we heard earlier this quarter, but he thought the school too rigid and didn't like it. For seven years he was, like Luther, an Augustinian monk, but then he became a priest and secretary to a bishop, who sponsored his attendance at the University of Paris, which he also found restricting. He then went to England, became friends with Thomas More, and began writing the Enchiridion Militace Christiani, the Manual of the Christian Knight, which, as I mentioned earlier, is thought to have inspired Durer's engraving of the Night Devil and Death we saw, and it became one of the first post-printing press bestsellers. This is a later portrait of him by Hans Holbein. It was also on a later visit to England while staying at Moore's house that he wrote In Praise of Folly, in which, as in Brant's Ship of Fools, about which we heard, virtually everyone is made fun of, from monks who wear mittens so they can claim they've never touched money, 
to lawyers, any one of whom, he says, can out-talk 20 women. It was Holbein who did the woodcut illustrations for this book, and it was because of the encouragement of Erasmus that he also went to England, as we'll see. This is the house, now a museum, in which Erasmus was staying at Anderlecht, a suburb of Brussels at the time of the general uproar following the meeting between Charles V and Luther at Worms. Erasmus was finally forced to leave Brussels because of his Lutheran sympathies, but then he went to Basel, which he was eventually forced to leave because of what were thought his two Catholic sympathies. As a thinker rather than a man of action like Luther, although this is an oversimplification, he had trouble making decisive commitments. He weighed all the considerations involved in any issue, then weighed them again, pondering pros and cons, whereas Luther would come to a decision and then stick by it no matter what. Here's the Erasmus house inside now. One of the issues on which Erasmus and Luther disagreed was the problem of freedom of the will. Luther decided that if God's in charge, that's it. We can't do anything he doesn't want us to do, otherwise we'd be the ones in charge. When Erasmus pointed out the consequences of this, for example, how can we punish criminals if God himself doesn't stop them? How can we criticize the sale of indulgences if heaven allows it to go on? Luther's response was pretty much just, I don't know, it's God's paradox, not mine. This is one of the thorniest issues in Christian theology, and Erasmus's view is essentially the Catholic one, while Luther's is essentially the Protestant one, although he didn't emphasize the determinism as much as Calvin, about whom we'll hear next quarter. Erasmus called the printing press the greatest invention ever, and despite what's happened in the world of invention in the last century or so, one could still make a good case for that claim. Whether or not Gutenberg should get credit for inventing the printing press is still argued about, but he was certainly among the foremost who worked on perfecting it in the mid-15th century. This is a hand-illustrated Gutenberg Bible of 1455 or 6, considered the first book printed with movable type using a screw press. This copy is at the Huntington Library, and there are about 50 others still surviving in various other collections. So successful was the new technology that it's been estimated that 20 million books were printed within the next 50 years alone. And many of them were, of course, Bibles, which made every Christian his own theologian, to the point that there are now some 400 Protestant sects, from Shakers and Quakers to Rockers and Rollers, with appreciable membership in the U.S. alone. This is the monastery of Underlinden at Colmar and Alsace. Many would say that while Cronach was the artist most closely associated with the Reformation, and Durer was the greatest artist of the age, counting all media, the greatest painter in the history of German art was Matthias Grunewald, whose masterpiece, the Eisenheim Altar, is now on display here since it was taken from its original home in the town of the same name across the Rhine in Napoleon's day. Not much is known about Grunewald's private life, but like all the great German artists, he was a Protestant at least in his basic religious outlook. In the early 1520s, he worked for Cardinal Albrecht of Brandenburg, but apparently left because of his growing sympathy for the Protestant cause. The Eisenheim altarpiece has, like many other such works, been taken apart for the sake of better display. You can see the crucifixion, the centerpiece of the whole thing, in the middle distance, and the whole rest of the east end of the church here is taken up by the other panels of this colossal work. The gruesome quality of the crucifixion in the center may in part be due to the fact that it was originally displayed in the chapel of the Antonite Leper Hospital at Eisenheim. It's been argued that the patients in the hospital would have been consoled by this vivid image of great suffering, which did, however, lead at death to paradise. And now you can see the crucifixion up closer. Be that as it may, however, if anything, this goes beyond realism, and the whole emphasis is on the suffering of Christ as a human being, rather than on his divinity. <laughs> 
In general, and I emphasize in general, Italian Renaissance representations of the crucifixion tend to be much less realistic than ones painted north of the Alps. It's always a sunny day in Italy, and sometimes it almost looks like a picnic could be going on at the foot of the cross. The approach is optimistic. This is the event which makes salvation possible, after all. This altarpiece was finished in 1515, before the official beginning of the Reformation in 1517, but one could argue that even so this is Protestant in spirit because of its pessimism. If everything is predetermined, then maybe this event doesn't provide salvation for me, because maybe I'm not one of those predestined for it. Calvin, as I suggested, will argue this even more emphatically than Luther will argue that no one deserves eternal happiness. We only get it by the grace of God who will save which among us universally miserable sinners he chooses to save. This view was meant to undercut the Catholic view that salvation can be earned through good works, but it can be argued that it throws into question the significance of the crucifixion itself. <laughs> This panel shows the meeting between St. Anthony, to whom the monastery and hospital were dedicated, and St. Paul, not the apostle, but the Egyptian hermit. The role of Anthony is likely being played by Guido Gersi, the abbot of the monastery who commissioned the altarpiece. His coat of arms is below the figure anyway. We're going to see more of the altarpiece in some detail now, while we hear one of the hymns Luther wrote, Vom Himmel Hoch, From Heaven on High, set to music by Michael Pretorius, whose father was a pupil of Luther's musical collaborator, Johann Walter. The iconography of the altarpiece comes mostly from the life of St. Anthony in the 14th century mystical revelations of St. Bridget. Anthony up closer. the hermit this is Grunewald's version of the temptation of St. Anthony in which as in Schongauer's version worldly pleasures are represented in their true soul threatening form Annunciation. The Angel Gabriel. A mystical concert from the revelation of St. Bridget. At the right, a sort of mystical Virgin Mary is shown adoring her earthly self. Here she is up closer. 
And here is the earthly Madonna in her human form. resurrection now with all wounds healed. Another of the great Protestant painters of the Reformation era was Albrecht Altdorfer, who painted what some consider to be the first pure landscapes in such pictures as this 1520 view of the Castle of Worth in the Danube Valley, it's now in the Munich Altpinakothek. We did, of course, see watercolor landscapes by Durer, which are earlier than this, but this is an oil panel painting, and is therefore maybe in a different class. This is not, in any case, just a sketch or personal souvenir. Like his fellow Protestants, Cronach and Grunewald, Altdorfer painted some of his most important pictures for Catholics, and his largest work was the St. Florian altarpiece for the Abbey of the same name in Austria. Like many such altarpieces, this was sold in pieces in the 19th century, but the panels you see here are still in the Abbey, or have been returned to it in some cases. They depict the passion, and many are given much of their power by the treatment of landscape. Many are also night scenes, which allowed him to create dramatic lighting effects, which are rare in early 16th century painting. Here's the agony in the garden up closer. He was also to use weather a lot, like the red clouds in the sky here, which look almost like they've erupted from a volcano. Some 20 years earlier, Leonardo pioneered the use of landscape, lighting, and weather to create the right mood for subjects, but Altdorfer's use of these things is even more theatrical and proto-baroque than Leonardo's. Altdorfer's landscapes sometimes have the look of something painted by an early 19th century romantic, like the American Frederick Church. Here from the St. Florian altarpiece is the resurrection now in the Vienna Art History Museum. This is a small picture, probably less than two feet high, and I think it benefits from being blown up on a projector screen. It's a big subject. The whole universe reverberates with the significance of what's happening. Clouds boil in the sky, wind whips through it, blowing Christ's flag one way and his robe the other. With just a little change in style, this could have been painted a century later by Rubens. Waldorfer's most famous picture is the Battle of Issus in the Munich Alta Pinakothek. Again, the whole cosmos seems to reflect the significance of the battle below, in which Alexander the Great is defeating Darius of Persia and chasing him off the field. The picture is full of minutely rendered human beings, but it's the weather, lighting, and landscape the stage set, as it were, 
rather than the actors that really makes the impact. The whole painting is about five feet high and this detail is only about the size of a page in a book. Aldorfer, a lifelong resident of Regensburg, where he was a highly respected citizen and member of the town council, is said to have turned down the office of mayor so he would have time to finish this. It's actually this painting of which Kenneth Clark said, because of its detail, that it looked like it had been painted by insects. This was also painted like the St. Florian altarpiece for a Catholic patron, William IV, the Duke of Bavaria. We're going to return to England now, and this could pass as a kind of picture of that country, I think, in the 15th century, fighting the Hundred Years' War, and then the Civil War, known as the War of the Roses. This is an anonymous portrait of Henry VI, whom you may remember was crowned King of both England and France on the death of Henry V in 1422. This was the high point in the Hundred Years' War for the English, though, and as we've heard, the career of Joan of Arc turned the tide against them, and this was followed by the defection of the Burgundians, the reoccupation of Paris by Richemont, and the final defeat at Castillon in 1453, after which England was left with nothing in France but Calais. Henry VI, as one could infer from this sequence of events during his reign, was anything but a great leader. And in the same year the English were defeated at Castillon, he began suffering from fits of madness. He had never really liked being king, and were it not for the efforts of his domineering wife Margaret, the daughter of René of Anjou, he probably would have just abdicated and gone into a monastery. Shakespeare has Margaret refer to him as a timorous wretch. This is Lancaster Castle in northwestern England, which is now a prison. Henry was the great-grandson of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, who built much of this. When he became incompetent to rule, Richard, the Duke of York, became the regent. This was a dangerous arrangement for Henry, because many considered that the Duke of York actually had a better claim to the throne than Henry. York was the great-grandson of Lionel, Duke of Clarence, who was the older brother of John of Gaunt. Warwick Castle from the air. When Henry regained his composure in 1455, he dismissed York, who then revolted against him with the aid of his nephew, Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, who lived here. With this, the Wars of the Roses began. The Yorkists used the white rose as a symbol, the Lancastrians a red one. The period covered by this war is not one of the high points in the history of English civilization and produced little in the way of fine art or fine thought, so we'll go through it pretty quickly. But having said that, it should also be pointed out that Shakespeare spent more time on the reign of Henry VI than on that of any other king, so it was not without its dramatic and interesting moments. The outer walls here, including the so-called Caesar Tower, which you see now, were built in the 14th century by the Beecham Earls of Warwick, and Richard Neville acquired the Warwick title with the king's permission by marrying the daughter of the last Beecham Earl. In 1455, Warwick and the Yorkists defeated the king's army at St. Albans and at Northampton in 1460. They won another victory and captured Henry himself. A compromise was then worked out, which would have allowed Henry to remain king and York to succeed him, but Margaret refused to go along with this de facto disinheritance of her son, her infant son by Henry, and her forces defeated and killed York at Wakefield later the same year. York's son Edward, however, took up the Yorkist cause, and in a Palm Sunday snowstorm at Towton, which you see now, in 1461, Edward of York, Richard Neville, and their fellow Yorkists defeated Margaret's Lancastrian forces. 
Dowden is regarded as the bloodiest battle that had yet been fought in England. Probably over 25,000 of the over 100,000 men involved on the two sides were killed. Edward was now crowned King Edward IV, Margaret fled to France, and Henry VI was captured and imprisoned in the tower. These are the state apartments at Warwick Castle now. For the first two or three years after Edward was crowned, Edward IV, Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, known as the Kingmaker, was really running the country. But in 1464, Edward married Elizabeth Woodville and ennobled her father, her five brothers-in-law, her son by her first marriage, and her brother, and Warwick's influence began to wane. The last straw for Warwick was the marriage of Edward's sister to Charles the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy in 1468. Warwick had pressed for an alliance with France to prevent the French from giving any help to the Lancastrian party, and this marriage created an alliance with France's enemy, Burgundy. Warwick, the man who had made Edward king, now decided to unmake him, and to make a longer story shorter, he met the exiled Margaret and her now 17-year-old son at Angers in France and proposed that they unite to overthrow Edward IV. Edward IV was forced to flee to his brother-in-law, Charles the Bold in Bruges, and Henry VI was propped back up on the throne again. But in 1471, Edward came back to defeat the army of Warwick and Margaret here at Barnet outside London. Warwick was killed in the battle. Margaret fled back to France and Henry VI was now executed. Edward, <coughs> Margaret's 17-year-old son by Henry, was killed in a last attempt to overthrow Edward IV here at Tewkesbury later the same year. And for the last 12 years of his reign, Edward IV's reign, there was something like peace. When he died suddenly, possibly of a burst appendix in 1483, he left behind an older son, the nominal Edward V, who was 12, and a younger son who was 9. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, Edward IV's brother, was the clear choice to be regent for the boy king, but he wanted to be more than that. He was able to get Parliament to declare them illegitimate, which meant he was then the rightful claimant, and he was so crowned. <laughs> This is an anonymous portrait now of Richard III. What of his two nephews then? What we can call the traditional view is that he had them murdered in the tower, but it's unlikely we'll ever be certain of the truth. The Richard III Society is devoted to his innocence and to the view that they were probably murdered by Henry VII after his army killed Richard at Bosworth Field two years later. If the boys were still alive by that time, they would have been as much of a political threat to him as they had been to Richard. Thomas More and Shakespeare after him treated Richard very badly, and because of the latter's way with words, he's remembered as a foul hunchback toad, rudely stamped and wanting in love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. But it's hard to know about that either. Shakespeare, if not More, was interested in effective theater, not the truth, and more, who purports at least to be writing history, makes so many clear mistakes that he has to be considered almost as dubious a source as Shakespeare. Whether or not he killed his nephews, he didn't get to sit on the throne long. Here at Bosworth Field in 1485, the much smaller army of Henry Tudor, a member of the House of Lancaster and direct descendant of John of Gaunt, defeated Richard, who was killed in the battle, offering, according to Shakespeare, of course, to trade England for a horse. And this is an anonymous portrait now of Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII, and as the son of the Welshman Edmund Tudor, made good the old prophecy once mocked by Edward I, to the effect that one day a Welshman would rule England. He married Elizabeth of York, the sister of the two boys who disappeared in the tower, and if Henry murdered her brothers, it looks like he must have kept it a well-guarded secret, 
Women have been known to overlook big flaws in rich husbands, but I'm not sure anyone could overlook that. In any case, this uniting of the houses of Lancaster and York marked the definitive end to the Wars of the Roses. As I mentioned earlier, the period of the Wars of the Roses did not contribute much to the history of civilization. But in 1475, during the peaceful period that followed the Battle of Tewkesbury, Edward IV had the St. George Chapel at Windsor rebuilt. This replaced the earlier chapel, which was the work of Edward III and his architect William of Wickham, about which we heard earlier this quarter. In fact, much of the finest Gothic architecture in England was built in the late 15th century, early 16th century, after the Gothic had pretty much gone out of style just about everywhere else. This late Gothic style in England is called perpendicular, you may remember, and the window tracery here is a very good example of that perpendicular style. This is the choir which has a Lyran vault. Lyrans, remember, are short decorative ribs between the main ribs, and this is also considered typical of the perpendicular style. Nine kings are buried here, including Henry VIII. And ironically, I guess, both Henry VI and Edward IV are buried here. Henry VI in the foreground tomb, and Edward IV in the chapel opposite. Architectural credit is difficult to attribute in the case of many such 15th century buildings, but William Vertu and probably his brother Robert were likely involved here. In the year Richard III became king, the fan vaulted hall of the Divinity School in the Bodleian Library at Oxford was also built. And the fan vault, though without lirns, is also typical of the perpendicular style. This was paid for by Duke Humphrey of Gloucester, the book-loving uncle of Henry VI, whose library is housed above it, and it is attributed to the master mason William Orchard. This is the perpendicular facade of King's College Chapel at Cambridge, of which Henry VI laid the cornerstone himself, though it was not finished until 1515. Robert Vertu and Henry Redman, about whom we'll hear after the break as the architect of Hampton Court, were among the architects who worked on this project. And this is the interior now with its fan vaulted ceiling, according to Wordsworth, an immense and glorious work of fine intelligence with roof self-poised and scooped into 10,000 cells where light and shade repose and music dwells. At the east end of Westminster Abbey is the Henry VII Chapel, which was not finished until well into Henry VIII's reign, and it's one of the last important pieces of Gothic architecture to be built in England. Robert Vertu is probably the architect we should give most of the credit for it. He was at least master mason at the Abbey when it was begun. The ceiling here has been described as like a stone cobweb. Henry VII had intended this chapel to honor Henry VI, his distant Lancastrian relative, he hoped to even have him recognized as a saint, but he was too parsimonious to spend the money pressing this case in Rome would have required. So Henry VI is not Saint Henry and is not buried here, but as we've seen at Windsor. <laughs> 
So Henry VII and his wife Elizabeth of York were buried here, and their tomb was made by none other than Pietro Torrigiani, the Florentine sculptor best known for breaking Michelangelo's nose. Their famous son was Henry VIII, and you can probably guess from looking at these effigies that in appearance at least he took after the York side of the family. And here's a portrait of baby Henry now, and we'll hear all about him after the break. 